John and Freddie, thanks for joining me. Freddie, you write for the magazine this week about how having a Republican president could change America's position on Ukraine. Under Joe Biden, the U.S. has spent more than $70 billion helping Ukraine. How would a Republican president, and I think more specifically in this piece, a Trump president, change that? Well, I think Trump's made it very clear uh, what he intends to do. Uh, he said that, um, he, he says three things about it. He says, first of all, uh, if he were president, Putin never would have invaded Ukraine. Uh, it's impossible to say whether that's true or not. Um, secondly, he says Europe's not paying enough. America's paying far more than Europe to the war effort, and he'd make the Europeans pay more. And thirdly, he says he would resolve the conflict within 24 hours, within a day of entering the White House. Uh, and I think what's quite interesting about this is a lot of hawks um, on the British side, on the NATO side, uh, and in America on the Republican hawkish side of the Republican Party, uh, worry that he actually might do that. Uh, but to their mind, that would mean making concessions to Russia, uh, rewarding Putin's aggression, as they put it, which would then encourage Putin to uh, be, be even more aggressive in the future, possibly with other states, the Baltics and so on. Mm. Uh, and I thought it was interesting, very telling this week, that Boris Johnson, who's now become a sort of global cheerleader for the, for the war effort, went to Texas to talk to some rich uh, Texas Republicans and some politicians and to sort of G them up to say that you are still backing the right horse. Ukraine's going to win this fight. There's going to be a magnificent counterpunch this summer uh, and the Russian military will collapse. I suspect a lot of people at lunch believed him. He makes the case very forcefully. Um, the difficulty for the Republican Party is a lot of their voters, and the polls show this, a lot of their voters are not um, aligned with that position on Ukraine. And as this election approaches, that's going to come into sharper focus. Fred, you mentioned there that Trump says things like, if I had been president, Russia would have never invaded. On comments like that, comments that he can end this war in 24 hours, do you think the public buy it? Well, I think that points towards a, a golden rule of Republican campaign dynamics now, which is that Trump can say anything and get away with it, and other candidates can't. Right. For instance, Ron DeSantis uh, recently, a few weeks ago, uh, found himself sort of boxed in on the question of Russia, because I think by instinct he's more of a conventional hawk, more of an Atlanticist. But he was pressed by the now-sacked uh, Fox News host Tucker Carlson to say, what, what is America's national interest in fighting Russia on Ukraine, or being involved in the war in Ukraine. And he replied, he said, it's not a vital national security interest for America to be further entangled in Ukraine. And he was much criticised for that in the media, and it didn't result in the Republican base uh, rallying towards him. In fact, if anything, I'm sure there were lots of other factors involved, if anything, his polling has declined since he made that statement. Mm. But Trump can say, I'll resolve it in 24 hours, and he gets away with it because nobody sort of asks him the further questions in the interview. Even on CNN, a, a hostile interviewer only wanted to ask him, do you want Ukraine to win? Mm. Um, and he said, I just want people to stop dying. And the crowd in New Hampshire uh, broke into an ovation. Uh, the, the more sensible question, I think, to ask him would be, how exactly are you going to do that? Right. Indeed. Um, we'll come back to Florida's governor. He's had a big week. But John, I want to bring you in. You're, of course, known for saying that NATO should take some of the blame for what's happening, happening in Ukraine. But let's pivot specifically to the Republican Party position here. What is the mainstream Republican opinion about Ukraine? And how big is this issue going to be, the issue of the war in the 2024 election? I think you have to distinguish between the elites and the public. Uh, and it's very important to understand that what the public thinks here in the United States just doesn't matter very much. The elites just do what they please. Uh, there's no question that uh, there are a lot of doubters uh, in the public, both on the Republican side and on the Democratic side. And it's likely that the number of doubters will grow with time. But the question is, how is that going to affect the elite? And the argument that's being made is that the Republicans are beginning to go soft on Ukraine at the elite level, and that if Donald Trump gets elected, there's a really good chance uh, that he'll pull the plug on the Ukrainians. Uh, this is not going to happen, in my opinion. Uh, the United States uh, is backing Ukraine to the hilt. Uh, 
And if the United States withdraws its support for Ukraine, its material support, Ukraine is going to collapse. It can't stand up to the Russians. The Russians would win a big victory. It's hard for me to imagine that any American leader, whether it's Donald Trump or Joe Biden, is going to allow that to happen. It's just not going to happen. We are too deeply committed to this war. Uh, there's too much Russophobia in the United States. There's too much talk about the fact that this is an existential threat that we're facing with Russia for us to cut and run and allow Ukraine to go under. Furthermore, just think about what the consequences will be for China. Uh, our credibility, people will argue, will be destroyed if we allow Ukraine uh, to lose. So I think Trump talks a good game. Uh, but what he actually does when he's in office, assuming he gets reelected in 2024, is another matter. And I would note here, just as a final point, that Donald Trump, when he ran for president and in his initial few months in the White House, said that he wanted to improve relations with Russia. He viewed Putin as a friend. He wanted to put an end to NATO and get out of Europe. None of that happened. And in fact, what did happen is that in 2017, it was Trump who started arming the Ukrainians. Obama, much to his credit, had the good sense not to arm the Ukrainians. But Trump decided to arm the Ukrainians. And we were as tough on the Russians during the Trump administration as we were in any other administration. So Donald Trump can talk all he wants about how he's going to do a 180 degree turn regarding American policy on Ukraine. But in my opinion, that's not going to happen if he gets reelected. You mentioned there that you think more fatigue will set in when it comes to the war uh, in terms of American opinions of it. Uh, South Carolina Senator Tim Scott has just launched his presidential campaign uh, with a very different view. Uh, he thinks that Joe Biden has not done a great job of explaining to the American people why the interventions have been so substantial in Ukraine, but that there is a case to be made. If you look at polling numbers in the states right now, there's certainly increasing debate between Americans about just how long the U.S. Should, should be supporting Ukraine, a debate between, say, one to two years and then indefinitely. But there does still seem to be a lot of support, a majority of support for helping Ukraine. There's no question about that. Uh, and uh, it's hardly surprising. If you look at how we talk about Russia in the United States and in the West more generally these days, uh, Vladimir Putin is portrayed as the devil incarnate. Uh, there's extreme Russophobia in the land. And the Biden administration and the establishment, the foreign policy establishments in the West more generally have done a brilliant uh, job of propagandizing uh, this war. Uh, so it's unsurprising that uh, uh, large chunks of the body politic in all these Western countries uh, are committed to seeing Russia defeated. Do you think it's propaganda that's convinced the American people that they should support Ukraine? Or is it the fact that they watch Vladimir Putin march his tanks over the border into Ukraine? No, it's clearly the propaganda campaign. It's truly amazing the extent to which our discourse uh, here in the West uh, is limited uh, so that we end up supporting the Ukrainians at every turn and opposing the Russians at every turn. There's hardly anything that's ever said that's positive about the Russian effort or that's uh, a possible explanation uh, in Russia's favor for why this war happened. Uh, uh, this is a, a truly outstanding case of extreme propaganda. Uh, the only case that I think comes close is what happened uh, in both Britain and in the United States during World War I. You want to remember that in World War I, there was no equivalent of Pearl Harbor or 9-11 that brought us into the war. Uh, 
And as a result, Woodrow Wilson had to go to great lengths to mobilize the American public to back the war. And this was especially true because the two biggest ethnic groups in the United States at that point in time were German Americans and uh, Irish Americans. And Wilson was deeply fearful that the German Americans would not fight against Germany and the Irish Americans would not fight with Britain. So we launched an amazing propaganda campaign. And uh, I think that since then, there has been no equivalent to that propaganda campaign until recently when Russia invaded Ukraine. And we have gone to great lengths to portray uh, the Russians in the most uh, negative light and to silence people who might have a somewhat different view. And that would include someone like me, of course. Freddie, Trump used to get a lot of criticism when he would go and shake hands with these dictators and human rights abusers. And his argument would be, well, look at the results. Don't look at the handshake. Look at the results. I am moving America away from this heavy interventionist foreign policy. And he would claim he was successful. Indeed, I think um, he certainly moved the Democrat Party into a more isolationist point of view. Um, do you think one of the reasons he's so hesitant to say how he would actually do what he's pledging to do to bring the war to an end in 24 hours is because those handshakes would not be feasible now? He would not be able to buddy up to Vladimir Putin in the same way. Um, he would have to take a more hostile approach. And frankly, that that could lead to results that um, that could lead to very different results than what the president is promising. I'm not sure. I think Trump's approach is always the sort of real estate uh, approach to, to foreign policy, which is, you know, you, you make deals, you, pay, you take positions, you, you deceive people with your positions if you have to. Um, and I think where Trump is effective as a, as a campaigner is that he often says things that Americans think, but no one in the public eye or no one in the elites, if you like, uh, will say. So he, there's a famous moment when he was asked about um, foreign authoritarian governments doing terrible things. And he said, do you think we're so innocent? Uh, and this was taken as a sort of very anti-American statement. But actually, I think a lot of Americans know that uh, their government has not done, uh, has done terrible things in the world, and, and they're quite honest about that. Um, so I think he has, a, he has a rhetorical ability with it. His deal-making ability as a as an statesman is, I think, as John suggests, uh, much exaggerated. But, you, you, you know, the fact that he would be willing to talk to Vladimir Putin and is willing to say that he would be willing to talk to Vladimir Putin is, does make him a different type of politician to a lot of the other candidates. Mm. Freddie, this week, Florida's Governor Ron DeSantis has launched his presidential campaign on Twitter. Uh, and if anyone's going to be a challenger to Trump, it is thought at the moment anyway that Ron DeSantis will be that person. Um, even if we just break this down into name recognition, some of the other candidates running don't come close. Would his policy towards Ukraine be much different from Donald Trump's? Well, his recent statements on it suggest that no, it wouldn't. Mm -hmm. um, but he'd certainly talk about it more in the language of international statesmanship. He wouldn't be saying, I'll just make a deal with uh, Putin and, you know, because I know his strengths and weaknesses and I know Zelensky's strengths and weaknesses. And so I'll just, I'll fix it. Mm -hmm. um, he'll talk more about international interests and uh, the national interest. Um, and I think so far it looks as though he knows that the, the conservative base that he wants to uh, rally are much more sceptical about what America's doing in Ukraine than the rest of the population. And so I think for now he's, he's tilting towards Trump. Tim Scott, on the other hand, is tilting towards the more hawkish position mm -hmm. and talking about you know, it being a national interest to degrade uh, Russia's military so that it can avoid an attack on UK sovereign land. Uh, I think that's, a, that's a, o an odd position, and I think a lot of Americans will think it's an odd position because they'll think, well, how is, um, is Russia really threatening American sovereignty? Mm. Um, and is not the war that is currently being conducted increasing the likelihood mm. of the only feasible, albeit unthinkable, attack on uh, America from Russia, which is a nuclear one, mm. which, of course, would be the end of the world? John, could, I, could, I, could I quickly just respond John, to something that Freddie said? I think he's exactly right that Trump views himself as a deal maker and he thinks that he can move in here and he can talk to Putin, he can talk to Zelensky, he can use pressure on Zelensky and he can cut a deal. Mm 
the problem that Trump faces is not simply that there would be resistance from the rest of the establishment if he tried to do that. The problem, the real problem is there's no deal to be had here, right? Nobody can figure out what the solution is to shutting this conflict down. And there are two reasons for that. One is the territorial issue. The Russians are not going to give back the territory they've conquered. And the Ukrainians want that territory back. And you can't square that circle. Furthermore, the Russians want Ukraine to be a neutral state. And Ukraine wants a security guarantee. And that can only come from the West. And you can't square that circle. So there is no deal to be had. So, you know, there's all this talk these days about using the Chinese as a uh, as a force to, or as a moderator uh, to work out some sort of deal. That's not a viable argument because, again, it has nothing to do with the Chinese. It's the fact that there's no deal to be had. So Trump can talk till he's blue in the face about cutting a deal, but there's no deal to be had. But he would, and John, obviously you're the great expert on international relations, so I defer to you on this, but he would have leverage. I mean, Americans' power is unrivaled. Uh, he would have significant leverage over Ukraine uh, because of the support that America has provided uh, Ukraine. And he would have significant leverage over Russia because of the threat that America can pose to Russia and the fact that the war has not been going according to Russia's plan so far. I think you're absolutely right that he would have significant leverage over the Ukrainians. Not total leverage, but significant leverage. But I don't believe he'd have any leverage over the Russians. The Russians don't trust the Americans, whether it's Trump or Biden, as far as they can throw them. And the Russians have a deep-seated interest in taking as much of Ukraine uh, as they can uh, and turning the remaining part of Ukraine into a dysfunctional rump state. And uh, promises from Donald Trump that they'll work out some sort of meaningful deal and therefore the Russians can make concessions is not going to wash. The Russians no longer trust us, and they shouldn't trust us. There's also a question about what would happen to President Zelensky if he did come to the table and walked away with a, a deal that your average Ukrainian did not think was acceptable. They could well oust him and bring in somebody else. It, it strikes me that there's no guarantee that either side, frankly, would necessarily declare this war over, even if President Trump did. I, I agree with that. And I think it's not your average Ukrainian. It's the ultra right in Ukraine. There has long been a powerful ultra right, a nationalist right in Ukraine uh, that wants to make no concessions to the Russians and is heavily into de-Russification of uh, Ukraine. And those people uh, would be very hard to get on board. And Zelensky's had his problems since he was elected uh, dealing with those people. So I agree completely with what you completely with what you say. Your average Ukrainian, of course, has has also been out there fighting. I mean, clearly there is still support uh, uh, amongst the country for for trying to defend what what they want to keep. Um, but Freddie, my, my last question to you is if Trump were to become president and he were to implement his agenda, I think we've established a lot of question marks over that agenda. Um, what would other Western countries be able to do? Would they be able to keep supporting Ukraine? Would they be able to do this without the United States? I mean, I think a Trump, second Trump presidency would be a graver threat to NATO uh, than the first presidency was. There was a lot of, sort of fear about um, NATO uh, being, Trump was going to tear NATO apart and so on because he didn't really see the point of it. Uh, in his first term, he just was agitating for, for other states to contribute more money. He didn't want America to pay so much. I think in a second term, with this situation in Ukraine, with all the pressures going on, uh, I think it would be a graver threat to NATO. Uh, I don't make any moral judgments whether that's a good or bad thing. Uh, I just think that would be the dynamic. Mm -hmm.